Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Natalie Nichols, and I'm the director of Global here at the RSA. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our special lunchtime, lunchtime talk. Just before we begin, could I ask you to make sure that your mobile phones are on silent? We're filming and we are live streaming today, so welcome to everyone watching, on, watching online, including a group of fellows we have who've got together in Bristol <laughs> to watch us. Um, we are also on Twitter, and the hashtag for today is hashtag RSA Originals, if you'd like to get involved in the discussion. So, we are also delighted that today's event is in partnership with a festival called the Seven Days of Genius Festival, run by 92nd Street Y in New York. So we're adding um, our contribution to this global conversation and exploring the power of genius and the positive impact that it can make around the world. So an extra special hello to our friends in New York who are probably just waking up and watching us over their bagels. So notice is over. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to Adam Grant. Adam is a professor of management and psychology at the Wharton Business School. He's an advisor to leading global corporations and organizations from Pixar to the United Nations and the recipient of many distinguished awards and accolades. I'm going to give a couple. He is one of Malcolm Gladwell's favorite social science writers, one of Business Week's favorite professors, and one of the world's top 40 business professors under 40. So you have an indication of how old he is. He gave a brilliant talk here a few years ago on his acclaimed book, Give and Take, which was about generosity. And he returns to the RSA stage today to share his thinking from his new work, Originals, How the Nonconformists Change the World. In his book, and this, uh, in his talk this afternoon, Adam will debunk the myth that successful nonconformists are born leaders who embrace risk at all costs. And instead, he'll share with us how all of us can be more encouraged to identify and nurture opportunities for creativity, innovation, that will change our lives and the way that we work. So there are a couple of key questions, I suppose, that we'll all be asking. How do we know that we're having or harboring a great idea? And how do we counteract fear and self-doubt? I'm sure Adam's talk will open up a whole range of questions and debates, so let's get straight to it. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Adam Grant. I can promise you it's all downhill from here. So there are several reasons why you might not want to read this book. And they start with the fact that the events that led up to it almost ruined my life. Um, I was working in an early job, and I saw that one of my colleagues was approached by a manager several levels up who he had never met, and she came and threatened to fire him because he was behind on several deadlines. I was a little disturbed by this, so I mustered up the courage to go and try to challenge the decision. And this went very much against my nature. I've always been somebody who followed the rules, who respected my elders, who wanted to get along with authority, to the point where, when I was growing up, I was called once and only once to the principal's office. And I cried on the way there, even though I wasn't in trouble. <laughs> and this was really my first attempt to, to try to challenge an authority figure. And I went in, and I, I said to my boss's boss that I thought that this was a bad situation for two reasons. One. Um, this had been really unfair, and he wasn't warned that this deadline was such a big deal. And two, he was nearing the decision to quit. And if he left, we would be in even more trouble than we were before. And I was waiting for a positive response. This boss's boss had been very supportive of me. And I was a little bit surprised when she dragged me down the hall to the women's bathroom, uh, which was the only room in the office without windows, and then told me that if I ever spoke up again out of turn, that I too would be fired. Uh, she used some slightly more vulgar language for that. <laughs> so I decided at that moment that I didn't want to ever have a real job, which is why I became a professor. <laughs> it is not a coincidence that I chose a field where you get to hide behind the bulletproof vest of university tenure, where people don't fire you for speaking your mind. But one of the things that I was driven to understand was how could I have spoken up more effectively? And I think this is a problem that a lot of us face. We all have ideas for how the world around us could be better. We see practices that don't make sense. We see rules that are broken. We see systems that have failed us. But a lot of times, we stay silent. The data show across industry is 85% of people, when they have a big idea or a bold suggestion, never say a word about it. Because they're afraid, and some of you might have felt that fear at some point. Just look around the room for a second, those of you who are here live. 
I want you to look for the most paranoid person and then point at that person for me. <laughs> okay, don't actually do it. But some of you are pointing at yourselves. And this is something that holds a lot of us back from speaking up. When we do speak up, sometimes we do it ineffectively. So one of the big reasons I wrote Originals was to ask, what happens after creativity? Once you have an idea, how do you speak up without getting silenced? How do you get heard? Where can you find a coalition of support? And I want to share just a little bit about what I learned, which I wish I had known in that disastrous situation. So the first thing that, that I found really interesting was I came across an entrepreneur named Rufus Griscom. And yes, that's his real name. Rufus started a parenting website called Babbel. And he decided he wanted to give people honest advice about parenting. He was tired of all of the lies, like it's fun and easy. And he wanted to tell people the truth. So he decided he would go and pitch investors. And I expected that he would have to look like this in order to get heard. But Rufus decided to do something a little bit different. He walks into his first time in the dragon's den. And he says, I'm thinking about starting this parenting website. Here are the three reasons you should not invest in my company. And he goes and tells his investors the three biggest problems with his business idea. Now, this is insane, right? You're supposed to go and pitch the reasons to invest, not tell your investors why they shouldn't back you. But Rufus ends up walking away with over two million pounds in funding that year. Why did this work? Well, part of it is it's a marketing gimmick, right? It grabs your attention. You're not used to entrepreneurs telling you, here's why my idea is terrible. But Rufus also does a couple things when he tells you the weaknesses of his idea up front. One is he shows that he's balanced and honest, that he's able to be self-critical, that he's not so in love with his own ideas, that he can't see their flaws. And two, he makes it harder for investors to think of their own objections. So one of the most interesting things about the way the human mind works is the easier something is to think of, the more common we think it is and the more important we think it is. Even when how easy it is to think of something has nothing to do with its importance or its frequency. So I always illustrate this with my students in the classroom by asking them to name a few good things about their lives. And then I ask them on a scale of 0 to 10 how happy they are. And then I get another volunteer and ask, can you give me 37 good things about your lives? And then they want to count each of their friends separately. And the list goes on for a while. And consistently, the people who only name three good things about their lives are much happier than the people who are asked to name more of them. And the reason is it's easy to think of three good things about your life. Right? You can say, OK, I have a great family. I like my job. And uh, the weather is not as bad today as it usually is here in London. But you have to work a little harder to come up with a dozen or two dozen or three dozen good things about your life. And then going through that process, struggling a little bit to think about what's going right, you walk away believing, you know what? Maybe my life isn't quite as good as I thought. Now, you can apply this reasoning to lots of kinds of situations. There's one psychologist who even applied it to a former prime minister, Tony Blair. He randomly assigned people to list either two things that they disliked about Tony Blair or five things that they disliked about him. And people who listed five bad things about Tony Blair liked him more than people who listed only two. This is an empirical fact, right? It's easy to come up with two things that I don't like about Tony Blair. He's better looking than I am, and he has more hair. But when I try, try to come up with five, I'm like, well, his accent is cooler than mine. I'm at three. I don't really have a fourth. It's a lot of work. He must not be such a bad dude. And this is exactly what Rufus Griscom does to his investors. When he says, here are three reasons you should not invest in my company, the investors start thinking, you know, I had two big concerns, and he covered both of them. So I'm going to have to struggle to think of some other problems with this business, and I want to show them how smart I am. So instead of just saying, here are all the reasons that your business that you think is great is actually terrible, now I'm going to try to come up with solutions to the problems you pointed out. And now as an investor, I get into joint problem solving, and I'm helping him fix the very issues that he's brought to the table. So what, what I took away from this is I should have been a lot more balanced in my own pitch. Instead of saying, this is a terrible injustice, this person never should have been threatened to be fired, I should have said, look, I know it's a big problem that he's behind on his deadline. And I think in spite of that, here are some reasons that we might want to keep him around anyway. And I think I might not have then got dragged into the loo. 
The second thing that I learned was one of the biggest challenges with being one of these original people in the world, someone who's a nonconformist, who stands out and speaks up, who really wants to drive creativity and change, is that often your ideas have to be radical in order to be original. And that makes it hard for other people to appreciate them. And so you have to become a little bit of a tempered radical, somebody who's like Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold, but just right, to get other people to accept your message. One of my favorite examples of this is an entrepreneur named Meredith Perry. Meredith was sitting in her dorm room as a senior at the University of Pennsylvania where I teach, and she got really frustrated one day that she had wireless internet but no wireless power. She's looking around thinking these devices have to be plugged in to charge. This does not make any sense. Why can't I charge my mobile phone or my laptop on the go? So she starts to read about different techniques for creating wireless power. It's thought to be impossible. And then she discovers that you can actually harness vibrations in the air as energy. So if you were able to stand near a passing train, for example, if you could somehow harness the vibrations that it generates, you could actually convert those into power. She goes and pitches the idea to some physicists, and they all say it's impossible. She gets in touch with mathematicians, engineers, Nobel Prize winners, and they all say this is crazy. Either the radiation hazards would be too great, or you lose so much power in the process of converting the vibrations into energy that this is just not viable. So Meredith has a problem. In order to get her company off the ground, she needs to build a prototype. But in order to build a prototype, she has to convince people that this is doable. And she's stuck with the chicken and the egg, and no one wants to give it a shot. So she goes out and pitches people. She says, look, I'm trying to build wireless power. I need to make a transducer that will help me efficiently convert these vibrations into energy. And engineers say, you can't do that. Sorry. And they won't work for her. And then she realizes, you know what? Maybe I don't have to tell them what I'm trying to accomplish. Maybe this big goal I have should be hidden because they think it's insane. So she switches her pitch. And instead of saying, hey, I want to make wireless power. Can you build me this transducer? She goes to engineers and says, I'm trying to build this transducer with these properties. Do you think you could build that? And instead of absolutely not, the reaction she gets is, maybe I could come up with something like that. I've never quite thought about it that way, but let me give it a shot. She's able to get enough engineers on board that they cobble together a prototype. And they now have a working prototype for creating wireless power. Her company is called U-Beam. And the lesson is that the more original you are, the harder it is for other people to appreciate your end goal. We saw this with Elon Musk. When he started SpaceX, one of his dreams was to try to get humans on Mars, to try to extend and preserve life and have opportunities to explore space. But nobody believed that you could get to Mars. So he sold his people on something much, much more palatable, much more tempered, which was the idea of saying, let's try to get a private commercial vehicle into orbit, and then we're going to try to land it back. Once you see that's possible, now Mars doesn't seem quite so crazy. Now, the third thing I learned, which has been quite powerful for me, is that the more radical your idea is, the more important it is to connect it to something people already understand, to make the unfamiliar familiar. And I want to give you a chance to experience this a little bit. So I'd like you to think of a song, any song that you know. And in a moment, you're going to tap the rhythm of that song to the person sitting next to you, like this. Think of your song whenever you're ready. Turn to someone and either be the tapper or the guesser. And we'll be back in 30 seconds. Go. Stop. Now, there are at least three people in this room who had entirely too much fun with this exercise. <laughs> but what I'd like you to do is just stand up if you guess the song correctly, please, for a round of applause, and then stay standing for me. <laughs> stand up if you guessed it. 
Okay, stand up again. Stay standing. You can sit when I name your song. Happy birthday. <laughs> uh, row, row, row your boat. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. ABCs. Mary had a little lamb. Jingle bells. Um, <laughs> Beethoven's fifth. Good, I can't even do the third. Uh, God save the queen. Um, we will rock you. Hey, Jude. What is it? Baba Black Sheep. Can I get partial credit for Mary Had a Little Lamb? <laughs> All right, thank you. So why do we do this exercise? Largely because when those of you who have kids, when they ask you what you learned today, you have now something fun to do at the dinner table. Um, what I think is fascinating about this is this was an actual study done at Stanford years ago where people are given a chance to tap songs. But before that, they have to make a probability estimate for the odds that the people around them are going to know their song. So they get to practice for a little while, and then they make their estimate, and then they tap. The average person thinks that 50% of people will recognize their song. But in reality, 2.5% of people recognize it. You think it's going to be 1 in 2, but it's really 1 in 40. Why? Well, there's a simple explanation, and many of you have already anticipated it. In order to tap your song, you have to hear the rhythm in your head. It's impossible. Try it. You can't do it. And that makes it also impossible to imagine what your disjointed tapping sounds like to someone who is not hearing the song in their head. <laughs> right? So I'm tapping a song, and I'm hearing da, 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 da. And you're hearing, what in the world is that? This is a great metaphor for communicating original ideas. Because when you pitch a new idea to someone, you are not only hearing the tune in your head. You wrote the song. You have spent days, weeks, years thinking about this idea. It makes a ton of sense to you. You know the lyrics and the melody by heart. And that makes it almost impossible to imagine what that original idea sounds like to someone who is only hearing it for the first time. What do you do about this? Well, the evidence says that people need, on average, 10 to 20 exposures to a new idea before they truly appreciate it. So there's a simple lesson. If you pitch an idea to your boss and it gets rejected, you just go back six minutes later and say, here it is again. No, that's, that's not the goal. Right? The goal is to master the art of repetition and figure out how to deliver the same message in a new way. Um, one way to do this is when your idea gets shot down one week, you come back the next week, you adjust your pitch and say, hey, I took your feedback really seriously. Here's a revised version of this idea. What do you think about it now? Sometimes that'll work. But in other cases, you have to take your novel idea and connect it to something that people already understand. And this actually happened years ago at Disney. There was a movie. This was the first attempt Disney ever made to create a movie based on an original script as opposed to adapting a time-honored fairy tale. And they had this script that nobody liked, nobody could follow. And it was rejected several times, and the screenwriters went back to the drawing board to try to pitch it again. Jeffrey Katzenberg was running the studio, and he said, this is a B-movie. It's terrible. I don't think it's going to make any money. And Michael Eisner is sitting there, grasping at straws, trying to find a hook for it. And he shouts out, could this be King Lear? Now, coincidentally, one of the screenwriters has reread King Lear a few weeks earlier. This is apparently what you do when you work at Disney. You read Shakespeare. And he just said, no, this has nothing to do with King Lear. I have no idea why you would ever think that, let alone say it. At least he thought that. He didn't say that out loud. And then a producer from the back of the room, Maureen Donnelly, shouts out, no, this is Hamlet. And all of a sudden, the movie clicks, and it gets made. And The Lion King is the most successful animated film of 1994. Now, for those of you who do not realize that The Lion King was based on Hamlet, neither did I. And I was like, oh, wait, I was supposed to get that. But what's fascinating about it is that the original pitch for Lion King was, I kid you not, Bambi in Africa with lions. <laughs> and people heard that. And they said, I have no idea what that's going to be about. I don't know what the characters are going to be. I can't envision the plot. But when you reframe it as Hamlet with lions, now you can say, of course, the uncle's going to kill the father, the son's going to have to avenge the death, and now you can imagine it being real. And it's such a good example of taking something novel and connecting it to a story that people already appreciated. And you see a lot of startups doing this today. There's a reason why you hear so many startups pitching themselves as being the Uber for X. 
because there are so many ways <laughs> that you could take on-demand availability for anything we use in society and say, we're going to Uberize it. And it's a way of taking something people don't get and make it just a little bit easier to envision or grasp. There is a Halo version of this cartoon. So we can make our ideas more familiar. And sometimes that helps. But sometimes we're going to the wrong people. And we need to do a better job finding allies. And one of the most interesting things I've found about originals is that they look for collaborators for, to support them in very unusual places. One thing you'll see consistently is that enemies make better allies than another group of people that we spend a lot of time with, which is frenemies. Those of you who have frenemies in your lives, you will know them because they're ambivalent relationships, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. And the evidence on this actually shows that it's literally unhealthier to have frenemies in your lives than to have enemies in them. So people, elderly adults, who have more ambivalent relationships are actually more likely to get sick. They have poorer cardiovascular function than adults who just have plain bad relationships. Yes, this is strange. <laughs> but negative relationships, one of the functions they serve is they're predictable. Right? When you know that someone is always out to get you, you can avoid that person, you can minimize your interaction, you can prepare yourself. Whereas frenemies are unpredictable. When you have people who sometimes have your back and other times stab you in the back, you don't know what to expect. And you expend a tremendous amount of emotional energy trying to manage these relationships. So it's often better to cut ties with frenemies and see if you can convert your enemies. The beauty of that being there's some classic research by a psychologist, Elliot Aronson, who shows that the people who like us most are not the ones who liked us all along, but the people who started out hating our guts and then came to appreciate us. Why? Because they have to overcome a lot of cognitive dissonance to get there, right? To, to change their minds and say, you know, this person that I thought was a terrible human being is actually pretty awesome. They have to work hard at that, and they really have to believe the message at the end of the day. They are also more credible advocates for you, because they can say, you know, I used to hate this person too, but I've seen the light, and here's why you might want to reconsider. Another place that you can think about finding allies is to question some of the assumptions you make about pairing up with people who share your goals. I always thought that people who had common goals would end up wanting to work together, support each other, because they're after the same thing. But the data show that common goals just as often drive us apart as they do bring us together. Freud wrote about this a century ago. He called it the narcissism of small differences. That may well have been his only good idea. But <laughs> what Freud was observing was that sometimes people in groups that share similar aims have a hard time getting along. Because more extreme groups look down their noses at mainstream groups as not serious, as sellouts. And one of my favorite pieces of data on this, uh, this comes from Judith, Judith White and her colleagues. She studies vegans. And what she shows is that vegans dislike vegetarians even more than meat eaters. <laughs> That's not a joke. It's an empirical fact. Because if you are a vegan and you look at a vegetarian, this person is not serious about the cause, not committed. Right? A meat eater, at least you weren't claiming to follow these principles and then falling short of them. And we see this with a lot of groups. It turns out that your best allies often are not the people who share your goals, but your methods. The people who have common tactics, similar ways of organizing to get things done. It's one of the reasons we've seen alliances crop up recently between environmentalists and gay rights activists, for example. Both groups are accustomed to picketing, and so it's really easy for them to coordinate and step in sync. So one thing you could look at is, who are the people that try to accomplish their goals the same way I do? Even if we're working toward different purposes, we can often collaborate much more effectively than people who are going to nitpick at each other's goals for not being quite as pure. Now, another place you could look for allies, and this is especially true in hiring, is to question some of the assumptions you make about the personalities of the people that you meet. So I spend a lot of time working with organizations on making better hiring decisions. And my hope is that all of them will work a little bit more like IKEA does. <laughs> As some of you know, I've spent a lot of my career studying the differences at the extremes between givers and takers. Givers being the people who enjoy helping others and often do it with no strings attached. Takers being people who are more selfish, all about me who will volunteer for interesting, important, visible work, 
and then leave the grunt work for everyone else, but somehow walk away with the lion's share of credit for collective achievements, which is why you love working with takers, right? And I don't want to be too harsh on takers. Some of them are just narcissists, and they believe that you know, if I want to win, someone else has to lose, so they have very fragile egos. And if you live in a zero-sum world, you feel like you have to put yourself first. There's another group of takers who used to be givers, but got burned one too many times, and said it's just dangerous to be generous. And then there's a third group of takers um, that we won't be talking about today. Those are called psychopaths. <laughs> um, but it's really important to understand who's a giver and who's a taker if you want people to be loyal to you, if you want people to have your back. And there is a personality trait that throws us off when we make these judgments. It's called agreeableness. Agreeable people are warm, friendly, polite, welcoming, nice people. Disagreeable people, more critical, skeptical, challenging, and far more likely to work as engineers, scientists, and financial analysts. Now, most people assume that agreeable people are givers and disagreeable people are takers. But in fact, there is no correspondence between those attributes. Because agreeableness, disagreeableness is your outer veneer. How pleasant is it to interact with you? Whereas giving and taking are your inner motives. What are your intentions toward others? So if you really want to assess people accurately and figure out who's going to support your original ideas, you've got to draw a two by two. And what you'll find is that the agreeable givers are easy to recognize but they're not the best allies because they say yes to everything and they want to please everyone. They don't like conflict. As a result, they will often cheer at your idea when you meet with them face to face, but then they're afraid to rock the boat and they won't go to bat to support your idea. Disagreeable takers are also easy to recognize, although you may call them by a slightly different name. And I think these are pretty easy to rid ourselves of. The other two combinations are the overlooked ones. There are disagreeable givers in our lives. And I think these are the most undervalued sources of support for original ideas. Because disagreeable givers, if you're having a hard time imagining what that would be, they're gruff and tough on the surface, but underneath they have others' best interests at heart. And I had a programmer at Google who said, you know, oh, disagreeable giver. That's somebody with a bad user interface, but a great operating system, <laughs> if that helps you. These are the people who we need to support us, because they are willing to give the critical feedback that we don't want to hear, but we desperately need to hear. They're willing to challenge the status quo, to become devil's advocates, to ask us hard questions. And we need to do a much better job valuing these people, as opposed to writing them off by saying, eh, kind of prickly, must be a selfish taker. These are the best advocates for ideas, because when you bring a new idea to a disagreeable giver, you will find that that idea will get torn apart in the service of making it better. And then if you can convince that person, it's the best version of an enemy. Right? It's the, the person who cares enough about you to try to really challenge you. And then once they're on board with the idea, they will run through walls to support you. Now, for those of you who are highly disagreeable, one of the markers of that, this is actual evidence, is that you feel more joy when you're in an argument than when you're in a pleasant conversation. <laughs> and if you have one of those people in your lives, I would say embrace them, because those are the people who are going to make your idea better and then ultimately go to bat for it. The group you have to watch out for is the agreeable taker, also known as the faker. This is the person who is always friendly and smiles quite a bit, but then doesn't end up supporting you. And I should just say, uh, my wife and I spent some time living in the UK a while back. Uh, so this is especially interesting to me, how cross-cultural differences play out. Um, when people ask where we lived, they're all excited. Did you live in London? No, we lived in Sheffield. Oh. <laughs> so the comparison between the US and the UK was fascinating to me, because I found that there were far fewer agreeable takers here that people were a little bit more upfront with their criticism, where I felt it was masked in the US. And there's some data to suggest that Americans feel extra pressure to be exuberant, to appear positive, even when they might hold a more critical, skeptical stance. But there is one country on Earth that's even further on the agreeable spectrum than that. Anybody know what the most agreeable country on the planet is? It's not Japan. That's close, sort of. Who said Canada? It is Canada. Now, before I go further, do we have any Canadians? OK, well, statistically, you're highly agreeable, so you will not be offended by what I'm about to say. There was a radio station in Toronto years ago 
that said, we're going to have a national contest. We need more Canadian pride. So let's come up with a slogan that's the equivalent of as American as apple pie. So I'm thinking the winning entry is going to be as Canadian as maple syrup or as Canadian as ice hockey. But no, four million Canadians voted for the best demonstration of national agreeableness that you will ever find. I kid you not, the winning slogan was, as Canadian as possible, under the circumstances. <laughs> now, for those of you who are highly agreeable or slightly Canadian, you get this right away. How could I ever say I'm any one thing when I'm constantly adapting to try to please other people? And if that's you, it's well to remember that just because someone is nice to you does not mean that they actually care about you. Now, there are some advantages of, a, of Canadian agreeableness. Sometimes the politeness will save you from danger. <laughs> but overall, I think we all need to value the disagreeable givers in our lives more. And ultimately, as I've studied originals, one of the things I'm struck by is that they're not that different from the rest of us. That they don't always have wild and crazy ideas. That sometimes they're just people who are willing to bridge the gap from saying, I have an idea, to I'm going to be one of the 15% who's willing to speak up about it, instead of the 85% who stay silent. And that a lot of the challenge of being original is really just about mastering the sequel to creativity. Saying, look, it's important to be great at generating ideas, but it's just as critical to know how to communicate them and get other people to hear them. And I think if you can do a better job outlining some of the weaknesses of your ideas, along with the strengths, that there's some real quiet confidence in that. Right, to say, I believe in this idea enough that even if I admit its limitations, I still believe that its advantages are worth considering. Sometimes that means hiding your purpose and not telling people what your real end goal is so they will get on board with your initial ideas. Sometimes it means connecting your ideas to something more familiar. And sometimes it means looking to your enemies, looking to the most disagreeable people in your lives for insight and feedback. And if you do that well, I think we can increase the number of people who speak up about their ideas. And we can decrease the number of ideas that end up on the cutting room floor. So I would love to see a world with more originals, and I hope it's a world you will help me create. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I said to you before, just before we came out that I found the book really refreshing, actually. And from an individual perspective, it kind of felt very intuitive. But when we looked at organisations or groups, actually, a lot of the ideas that you're talking about don't seem to come forward. So I suppose my question really is, in the book, Adam, you say that there isn't a lack of quantity of ideas, but that we're very bad at evaluating ideas to take forward. Um, what can managers do or people who are in a position where they are faced with a range of ideas? Do, we, you know, do I have to be an original to recognise another original idea? No, in fact, the, often originals are the worst at recognising them, <laughs> right? Because they, they fall in love with their own ideas and they have a hard time stepping outside of that perspective. Um, one of the, the hallmarks of originality actually is, is often being someone who is so drawn to novelty that you forget to think about usefulness and mm. ask, like, is this crazy idea actually practical? Um, so it's often the, the more conformist people among us who are good at saying, you know, is this, is this even possible that other people would ever like it or accept it? So how do managers get better at this? Um, there's a, a brilliant study on this by Justin Berg, who looked at circus artists. Mm -hmm. uh, so think Cirque du Soleil. These are the you know, people doing all kinds of new acts to keep you entertained. And um, he had them all submit videos of their performances. And then he wanted to know, how could you predict which ones were going to be good? So artists could not evaluate their own ideas accurately. They were way too positive, and they thought that their acts were way better than they were. Managers were far too negative. They looked for all the reasons that I, an idea would fail instead of the ones that would succeed or the reasons to consider it. And um, there was one exception to that, which is clowns. Everyone hates clowns, it turns out. So none of the clown <laughs> acts succeeded. But the rest of the time, the managers were too harsh. So there's a third group of people who were really good at evaluating creative ideas. It was fellow circus artists other okay. performers viewing each other's videos. Mm -hmm. They were the best forecasters of which um, acts would get the most votes from audiences, which acts would raise the most money, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. And a lot of that was because they weren't so positive like you were on your own video, because they had some distance. But unlike managers, they were in the business of developing creative ideas. And so they were really motivated to see the potential and unusual possibilities. 
So how do we get managers mm -hmm. to think like them? What, what Justin found in some follow-up research is that if a manager just spends five minutes brainstorming his or her own ideas before evaluating other people's ideas, that manager will get more open to novelty. So if you can get yourself in a creative mindset, then you're less likely to commit these kinds of false negatives where you reject really good ideas. And I think if more managers had done that, it's possible that Harry Potter would have found a publisher much earlier. <laughs> and lots of other ideas would have maybe taken shape. That's I would think so. Um, so the second question I have before I open up to the audience is about power. It's not something necessarily you talk a huge amount about in the book. Um, you say that originality starts with creativity. And at the RSA, we would agree with you. So uh, we believe that we need more creative ideas to solve the complex problems that the world faces. Um, and we call it something called the power to create, so unleashing people's ability to lead fulfilling lives. Um, but in the book, you make a really interesting point that those that are disempowered, to an extent, accept the status quo as a kind of an emotional way of dealing with their fate. Um, so with so many books focusing on leadership, and, and to an extent, this is, this is kind of one of them, but it actually makes the point that normal people have power. How can we create change from the bottom and from the middle as well? I don't think it's always easy. So, yeah, I mean, the, this, this body of research on system justification theory is, is disturbing and unsettling. Mm. This political psychologist, John Jost, has all this evidence that the people who are most disadvantaged by a system are the ones often who are the most willing to support it. Um, and a big part of that is because people want to believe in a just world. It's, mm. it's hard to, to survive and function in a society that you think is fundamentally unfair. So a lot of times people will take, you know, sort of ordinary everyday injustices and they'll say, you know, this is, this is obviously a fair world that I live in. And so it must be me. I just don't deserve more. Um, and unfortunately, it, that becomes a little bit of an emotional painkiller, right? On the, on the one hand, they feel better about the world. On the other hand, it kills their creative will and their moral courage mm. to actually act to try to change the system. So what can we do about that? I think the first thing we need to do is we need to get people to think differently about um, regret. A lot of people don't act because they're afraid that they're going to regret taking a risk mm -hmm. or going out on a limb. But in the long run, the biggest regrets we have are the, the errors of omission, not the errors of commission. They're actions that we failed to take that we wish we could do over. And I think if we, we help more people become aware, you know, as you look back on your choices, you're not going to regret taking initiative. You're going to regret standing still. Yeah. Um, a lot more people will act. Um, I guess the other thing, in, in terms of actual techniques, if you want to, to drive change from the bottom or the middle, I think one of the best things that you can do is try to destabilize the status quo. So a lot of times I, I see people coming with new ideas um, into their organizations and they'll say, you know, I have this great idea, we should change in the following ways. And leaders are like, but I already like the way things are. Mm. And they forget that before you paint a, a vision of a more hopeful future, you have to get people uncomfortable with the present. And um, that usually involves saying, look, here are all the things that are not right about the current situation. And by the way, here's a way to try to make it better. Um, and I think that, that cu cultivating dissatisfaction with the present um, is usually a precursor to getting people excited about a different future. Great. It sounds really easy when you say it, right? <laughs> yeah, just do that and you'll be fine. <laughs> just everyone go against what um, the status quo is. Um, right, I'm going to open up to the audience. So if you have a question, could you please raise your hand? We have some roving microphones. Um, we'll take a bank of three. So we've got a lady here and then these two gentlemen. Hi. Hi, Adam. Uh, I'm Amma Marston, and um, thank you so much for your talk, and the book is really interesting. I guess, um, given that you are a board member of Lean In, and um, Sheryl Sandberg has written this fantastic opening for you, I'm curious as to what you think about the gender dynamics of being able to be an original and um, be able to be uh, speaking out. And I just wanted to get your thoughts also about the number of women who are able to be public intellectuals. OK, great. Thank you. Um, and okay, yeah. um, thank you for what you have said. May we have some practical tips, please, for first-time parents who exist in a state of perpetual harassment? <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> Look, I, I'm muddling through this like the rest of you. So I, I will just point out there's an irony here, right? You're asking a man about women, and then you're asking a, a mildly uh, sleep-deprived parent how to parent. But I will do my best to answer both questions from evidence. Okay. Most of your examples today have been in the business field. But does the theory apply exactly the same to the political field, where an aspiring 
same candidate, you'll be at the same time agreeable or disagreeable, give or take it, depending on who's listening to the tune in the listener's head. Okay. <laughs> Mentioning no names. <laughs> um, so, first question. Um, <laughs> thoughts on your on gender dynamics have been an original, which is great timing because tomorrow is International Women's Day. Yep. Um, and, um, and happy belated Mother's Day to those who celebrated it. Um, Amma, thanks for the question. I think it's incredibly important. So the, the backstory on this is uh, my first book, Give and Take, came out shortly after Lean In. And Cheryl and I were speaking uh, at an event back to back. And she started grilling me on some questions about gender and, and givers and takers. And I, I had a few thoughts, but a lot of the questions she asked were things I'd never thought about before. Um, and I think this is so powerful when you bring research and practice together. A lot of the things she'd seen as a leader, academics had never thought to study. So um, I had a long flight back cross country. I spent hours reanalyzing a decade of data. And what I found deeply, deeply disturbed me. Um, I naively believed that in the 21st century, we evaluated original ideas on their merit, as opposed to the gender of the person sharing them. Um, yeah, I know, it sounds ridiculous. <laughs> But I, I worked with a bunch of organizations that were very serious about trying to do that. And you know, I, the number of the organizations that I had studied or consulted for had very good um, representation of women at the top. They had um, actually more women in the pipeline for leadership roles than men. And I, I way overgeneralized that. And what I found across lots of different industries, um, healthcare, financial services, for example, was that when men spoke up with a new idea, they got rewarded for it and celebrated. And when women spoke up, either they were not heard uh, because they, they spoke too timidly, uh, or they were judged as too as aggressive, and there was a lot of backlash. Um, literally, even with the same exact idea being voiced in the same words, um, men got positive feedback, and women were either ignored or rejected, on average. And you know, I think this is a travesty in the 21st century that this continues. Um, I wish these data didn't exist. I wish we didn't have to even talk about it, because I would love to see an, an equal world. But um, I think the reality is that women face a double bind in the domain of championing original ideas, just like they do in lots of other domains. And the biggest challenge is that men are stereotyped as ambitious and results-oriented. Women are, are stereotyped as more communal and caring. And that means there's a greater risk when women speak up that people are going to look at that idea and take it as a threat or as a violation of gender norms. So how do you get around this? Well, one way that, that women often deal with this effectively is to be extra careful to highlight that their suggestion is for the good of the group or to develop a track record as a giver. Women get punished more than men for not being givers. Um, it's part of what they're expected to do as they operate. And so if this is an idea that's self-serving, um, there's more backlash against women than there is men. Another thing is, um, I think one of the most effective techniques for influencing others is asking for advice, uh, particularly if you're going to men. So men love to be asked for advice, right? It makes them feel important. Um, so do women. Well, yeah, everyone likes it, but men especially <laughs> revel in it. And uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, to paraphrase him, once said, like, hey, we all admire the wisdom of people who come to us for advice, because they have really great taste. <laughs> and you know, the, the reality is that um, if you study both men and women trying to have influence, when they go to others and say, you know, I'd really love your guidance about how to present this suggestion, other people are far less threatened by it, because they're, th they're flattered by the approach. They have to do some perspective taking in order to say, well, here's how I would, I would pitch this if I were you and they're much more likely to support and advocate for the idea as well. And I think that's one of the, the most effective and the least threatening ways to bring ideas to the table. Um, you asked about um, women as public intellectuals as well. Um, I'm a big fan of the op-ed project, uh, which is dedicated toward um, giving more women a voice in major newspapers um, and encouraging them to write down their ideas, to submit them, and helping open these often hidden doors to getting published. I think that's incredibly important. Um, Cheryl often says, you can't be what you can't see. And I think we need more visible role models of female public intellectuals in order for people to get used to the idea. Um, and it's, again, sad that we're, we're still in a place where people aren't accustomed to it. OK. Next the, question. the second question was, any advice for first-time parents? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the, the most important thing that I've learned about uh, parenting, I would say I'm going to start with it in the domain of raising a giver, and then I'll connect it to originality and nonconformity. So I. Um, I was really surprised by some research that I read. I have always thought that if you want to raise kids to be generous and moral, what you should do is reinforce good behavior when you see it. That you don't have to shove values down kids' throats. Instead, you know, kids are naturally caring and helpful in various situations. And if you can kind of swoop in when that happens mm -hmm. and encourage it, then they'll repeat it more. So I would always say to our kids, oh, thank you so much for sharing a toy. Wow, I really appreciated you helping out. And a lot of this research actually suggests that in the domain of character, it's better to praise the person than the behavior. So yeah. instead of saying, thank you for helping, I should have been saying, thank you for being a helper. 
Instead of saying, wow, that was really giving of you, I should have said, wow, you are a giving person. And what that does is it internalizes the identity. Right? Kids start to take it in as part of who they are. Now, that seems to work best around age eight in the data. So for those of you who, whose kids are older, you're screwed. <laughs> no. uh, it's just, it, it takes more effort right, to, to change identities as they're beginning to crystallize. But there's evidence even as young as three, if instead of asking kids, if you want them to clean up a room, for example, instead of saying, will you help, you say, will you be a helper? And the rates of helping go up by 22 to 29%, because kids want to earn the identity. And um, so I think that the, you know, the corollary of this for raising creative children is you can also complement this kind of character, right? I, I frequently will find myself saying to our kids, wow, that artwork was so creative. What I should be saying, you are so creative. So that they don't lose sight, as, as Sir Ken Robinson so frequently talks about, of creative identities as they age and forget that they're capable of, capable of doing things that are new. For those with teenagers, if you're worried about them following the crowd and doing things that might not be appropriate or legal, instead of saying, you know, you, you don't have to do what your friends are doing, what I would say is you are a nonconformist. And I would find them examples uh, in their own history of times when they went against the grain um, to show them that that's the kind of person they are and give them the confidence and the courage to say, you know what, I don't have to be a sheep. This is who I want to be instead. Um, so that kind of praise, I think, is really useful for, for those who are parenting. Um, the other side of this is um, you can apply this to criticism, too. So um, if you want to reduce cheating rates, for example, instead of saying don't cheat, you say don't be a cheater. <laughs> and cheating is literally cut in half. Because now your behavior casts a shadow. Right? Before I could cheat and say I'm still a good person. Now I'm like, oh, I don't want to be a cheater. And what, um, then what happens when your kids cheat anyway? There's one emotion that works better than any other, which is disappointment. <laughs> Uh, it works much better than anger, much better than immediate forgiveness, because it said, I had really high expectations of you, and you fell short of them, but I believe you're capable of better. And disappointment cultivates guilt, which is the most powerful of all moral emotions in my, in my read of the data. Um, we all know that guilt is the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> and uh, Irma, Irma Bombeck said it first, but it's true in the data that when kids feel guilty, they feel like, this is a lot, a lot of what Brene Brown talks about yeah. with, with the difference between shame and guilt. Um, shame is often the feeling that I'm a bad person. Guilt is I did a bad thing, which means I can do better tomorrow. And I either need to right my wrongs or I need to find a way to change my actions. And to tie all this together, the cool thing about making kids feel guilty at appropriate moments um, is that when you look at the parents who succeed in raising creative children, um, the most creative architects in a country, for example, as compared to their technically skilled but less original peers, they had parents who focused heavily on teaching moral values, um, more so than emphasizing rules. And when they emphasized values, their kids were actually engaged in conversations like, excellence is important in this family. What kind of success do you want to achieve? And then their kids actually started to take some real ownership over their values. And when it came time to challenge the orthodoxies of a profession, they were much more comfortable saying, you know, I know other people disagree with me, but this is who I stand for. And those occasional pangs of guilt when they fall short of those standards help to keep them motivated to, to step up and, and speak out. Great. So we want to have some make children feel guilty. <laughs> That's very helpful. And then the last question was whether or not some of these theories can be applied to the, to the political sphere and not just to the business world. They can. And how? Next question. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, I, I don't know if I have um, seen that many politicians who are very clearly givers, right? I think that there, there are lots of examples of people who are drawn into politics by the ethos of public service, who are motivated to help others. But the, Bill Clinton said years ago that politics is a getting business. You have to get votes and donations over and over and over again. And you know, I think a lot of people shift away from giving as their style as they, they move into politics and or um, they decide that they're going to be supporting other candidates, but you know, being in the spotlight is, is not necessarily for them. Um, I think the, the question of, of conformity and nonconformity is fascinating when we look at political candidates, because I think what most people want to vote for, and this holds cross-culturally, um, is for what psychologists call optimal distinctiveness, which is the idea of, of striking a balance between fitting in and standing out. Mm. So if you're too much like other candidates, if you follow too many of the norms of the party, people think you're just a puppet. Right? And they think that no change is going to come, and nobody ever likes their current administration, so they always want things to be different. Um, on the other hand, if you're too much of a nonconformist, you end up um, violating people's values, you end up appearing to be either unpredictable or radical, 
And so a lot of this kind of tempered radicalism turns out to be pretty important for politicians. Um, and that's one of the reasons we call them politicians. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, a second round of questions. I think there was one. I'll give shorter answers this time. That's OK. Um, one uh, question over there, and then a question over here, please. Yes. Sorry, was there another one on that side? Oh, yeah, so can we take these two questions, Matthew? Thanks. Hello, I'm Roxanne. I'm a fellow here at the RSA. I was interested in the idea of disagreeable givers, and it struck me that they're not a million miles away from the idea of critical friends. And entrepreneurs are often encouraged to find some critical friends when they're developing their organisations. But they're quite difficult to find and difficult to take advice from, so I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. <laughs> There's a new website right there. Hi, uh, I don't think you, you can see me, but, uh, but I, I exist. <laughs> Gareth Wong, hi, hi Prof. <laughs> Adam. Um, great insight. I, I just wondered if you can uh, write another book about asking the right question and doing the right thing. Because I think uh, you, you allude to you know, ethics and, and other things. Uh, one of the things that annoys me is Elon Musk. Uh, I think he's doing great, but what's the point of spending billions you know, sending people that are about to die uh, you know, in, in somewhere, you know, um, but uh, things over here is not fixed, which I'm quite sure he could if he wanted to. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then finally, question, Adam. Hi, Adam. I actually loved your last book, Give and Take, and um, I've seen you, a lot of your talks online and stuff, so I have a, a personal question. You know, at, uh, you're in your early 30s, all these accolades, books, tenured professor, what does the Adam Grant bucket list look like at this age? <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, so, first question, disagree disagreeable givers, where can you find them? I think, I think this is hard. I think you know, it's funny, actually. Uh, I had this conversation with, uh, with a lot of the, the executives that I work with. And when I ask them who they go to for feedback, their most common answer is my spouse and two or three of my best <laughs> friends. And the, the question I want to ask back is, what about all the people who really genuinely think you're a bad mm. leader? How often do you talk to them? Um, I see this a lot with writers, too, um, when, you know, when people reach out with early drafts of manuscripts. Um, I'll ask them, who did you go to for feedback? And it's usually only a group of trusted advisors mm -hmm. who already are you know, big supporters. And it's like, no, you should, you should give it to a couple of your professional enemies and see what they think of it. Um, I think that, that finding people like this is not always easy. And so I think if you don't have disagreeable givers already in your life, the best thing you can do is you can create a norm of criticizing each other in the spirit of helping. Um, so if you don't have a critical friend, you have to convert someone into a critical friend. Uh, I think by far the easiest way to do this is to share the limitations mm -hmm. that you see in your own work first. Um, this dovetails a little bit with what Rufus Griscom did, but I have found um, a lot of times I'll, I'll write papers with our, our doctoral students, and they'll be very reluctant to edit things that I've written or to challenge things that I've said because they, they don't want to, you know, I guess, challenge my authority, uh, which bothers me a lot because I try to create low power distance in the mm -hmm. first place. Um, but there, you know, there is a hierarchy, right? And I guess I have fake control of whether they graduate or not, which is slightly frightening, uh, <laughs> especially if you work with me. But I think that ultimately what's been useful there is for me to say, look, um, here's, here's this paper that you know, we're working on a draft of. Here are the four sections that I'm most concerned about. Here are the flaws that I see in them. And all the reviewers are going to see them anyway. So the better we can do it anticipating now, the better we can address them. And then they're like, oh, actually, I had, I had a couple of those issues, and then mm -hmm. here are a few other things that I saw, and I think any time you, you make your weaknesses more visible to other people um, and you show that you're receptive to, to admitting that you have some weaknesses, it's not so hard for people to challenge and criticize you anymore. Yes, yeah, so it's really about creating a dialogue and we have been brave enough to open up yourself to that dialogue and that criticism. Yeah. And then the second question, I think it's fundamentally a question about ethics. Um, you know, Originals talks about a whole range of people doing a whole range of things, um, but it's fundamentally about people being able to affect change and hopefully to make the world a better place. Um, any thoughts on how you can link uh, this kind of original creative capacity with maybe more of a moral or ethical stance on our role in the world? Maybe. Did you, uh, did you see anything through your research really that kind of brought that out? Yeah, I mean, when I think about originals, I think, you know, there are a couple of archetypes, right? They're often entrepreneurs who are trying to, to champion new ideas, but they're also social and moral change agents who are trying to fix a lot of the problems we see in the world. And I think that, you know, I guess I, I feel like a lot of this terrain has been covered so well by other people that I don't have something novel to say about it at this stage. 
Um, on asking the right questions, Gareth, I would say um, Warren Berger's book, A More Beautiful Question, okay. uh, is an outstanding read. It's all about uh, how to teach kids and adults to ask the right questions and how to find interesting problems as opposed to just trying to solve problems that people already know exist. And uh, one of my favorite parts of that book is when he asks, what if companies, instead of having mission statements, had mission questions? Hmm. I'm like, I don't know. That's a meta question. <laughs> But uh, he also spends a lot of time writing about how we can um, build schools where kids are encouraged to ask really deep questions, which I think is great. Um, on doing the right thing, one of my favorite reads is Jonathan Haidt's book, uh, The Righteous Mind, mm -hmm. uh, which also has some interesting implications for the political question that came up. Um, and I think it uh, does an outstanding job mapping out what are the major moral values uh, that exist in society and how do more liberal and conservative groups tend to divide on those. And actually, in your book, you do point out that we spend a lot of time kind of jumping to solutions rather than maybe not spending enough time asking questions about what the problems are. Yeah, this, uh, this goes back, actually, to the first question as well. Um, so one of the organizations that I've been amazed by uh, in terms of really getting people to be critical friends to each other is the hedge fund Bridgewater. And um, they do some things there that I would not necessarily expect that most of you will do. They videotape and audio tape all their meetings. Oh, wow. uh, and their goal is to remove politics. Uh, they say, look, you shouldn't ever stab someone in the back. Instead, you should front stab them. And what does that mean? <laughs> it means tell them what you really think to their right. face. <laughs> yeah. Like instead of talking behind their back, right? Like they, they will call you a slimy weasel if you have a negative opinion of someone and you don't share it. And, um, but I think what they do brilliantly is they say, look, no one has the right to hold a critical opinion without speaking up about it. And otherwise, if we don't hear dissenting voices, mm -hmm. then yeah. how are we going to think differently? How are we going to beat the market? It's impossible. Um, so one of the, the best things that I think you can do to stimulate that is something that I watched Ray Dalio, the, the billionaire founder, do. So he got an email one day that said, uh, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it said, dear Ray, um, it's from three levels below. This guy that today I'll call Jim wrote it, because that's his name. Um, Jim, <laughs> Jim says, uh, Ray, I give you a D minus for your performance in this meeting. It was a total disaster. I think you blew um, the entire meeting, and we're going to lose this client. Now, I don't know a lot of people who would send that email to begin with. I certainly don't know a lot of founders yeah. who would keep that person on staff. Ray's response, though, was revealing. He writes back and says, I'm sorry I let you down. He copies the entire management committee of Bridgewater and says, can you investigate this situation, review the history, and see whether this is a pattern for me so I can learn to avoid it moving forward? And then the co-CEO of Bridgewater copies the entire email thread to the whole company <laughs> so everyone can see how Ray responds to this criticism. And I think that that, you know, fundamentally is what I want to see more leaders do, right? If they can model that kind of openness to critical feedback, it sends a message to everyone. One, I really want to hear your ideas. Right? I care more about getting good information yeah. than I do about protecting my fragile ego. Um, and two, it also signals that other people should be having those kinds of difficult conversations. And it also means that this culture of uh, kind of achievement seeking means that that will be broken in such a way that where we can be a bit more free to not necessarily agree. Or yeah. to not be right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, this, this actually, um, on the Elon Musk point, uh, you know, I, I personally think what he's doing is incredibly important. I think that, um, you know, figuring out whether it's possible for humans to survive in space in the long run is going to be one of the most essential things that we do for the species. Um, you can agree or disagree on that, but one of the things that Elon has done um, is he's tried to make it unsafe not to speak up. Yeah. So that, you know, you're evaluated positively if you bring ideas, suggestions, concerns, and especially, Natalie, to your point, problems to the table, even if you don't have a solution to them. If you want to have a high reliability organization that doesn't have catastrophic failures, you need to know everything that's going wrong, even if it's uncomfortable. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then to the final question, I'm going to insert a question of my own there. And so the, the final question was, what is left on your bucket list? Um, as if there is nothing left on your bucket list. Uh, and I'd quite like to know, how has your work influenced your own behavior? So the first question is hard. I, I guess I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, I tend to, to think about the things that I want to do now, as opposed to the, the things that I might want to do in five or 10 years. Because if I looked 10 years ago, I would have had no idea that I would mm. be doing any of this. And um, although many of us carry the delusion that we can plan ahead, um, it's often, uh, I had a great mentor, Brian Little, who told me that the most important thing that I, I needed to learn in order to, to achieve my goals was that I needed better acuity of peripheral vision. Okay. And I was like, wait, do I have binoculars? Yeah. Like, what, what do you want me to do? Um, and what he told me was that I am so goal-oriented that he was worried that I might experience tunnel mm. vision and miss out on you know, exciting opportunities and meaningful events that might be like a little bit adjacent to where I normally focus my attention. And this goes right to how this work has changed my behavior. 
so as you know, um, I ended up uh, studying procrastination. Uh, so I was interested in uh, how people become original. And I was uh, struck by the fact that there were a lot of originalists out there who were big procrastinators. Leonardo da Vinci, 16 years on and off on the yeah. Mona Lisa, constantly getting distracted. Um, Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, he, I he felt like a failure, right? He wrote in his journal over and over again, tell me if anything ever was done. Uh, what he didn't realize, though, is that some of those distractions, he was curious about optics, and he ended up doing some experiments mm -hmm. on modeling light that transformed his painting and may have helped him become the Renaissance man. Frank Lloyd Wright procrastinated for almost a year on his greatest architectural masterpiece, Falling Water. He was so late on it that the client literally drove out to see him and said, I will not pay you. I demand that you produce a drawing right here on the spot. Okay. Uh, and you know, he'd been working it out in his mind. Uh, as Aaron Sorkin, the screenwriter, said, you call it procrastinating? I call it thinking. <laughs> um, so I was really intrigued by this. And um, I've always been the opposite of a procrastinator, a precrastinator. Um, this is a term uh, for those of okay. you, yeah, for those you who don't know it. Um, the, a precrastinator is somebody who basically rushes to do everything early and finish it in advance. Um, you know that panic you feel when it's a few hours before a big deadline and you haven't started yet? I just feel that a few months early. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, long story short, I've, I've always taken pride in, in trying to do things as soon as possible, because anything worth doing is, is worth, worth doing early. Um, but then I had this student, Jihei, who came to me and said, you know, I have, I have my most creative ideas when I'm procrastinating. And I was like, that's mm. cute. Where are the four papers you owe me? <laughs> <laughs> no, she was highly creative. And I challenged her to go and test it. She got a bunch of data from different companies. People filled out surveys on how often they procrastinated. We got their bosses to rate how creative they were. And sure enough, the procrastinators like me were less creative than the, the, mo the moderate procrastinators. And I was like, well, what happened to the, the chronic procrastinators? And she said, I don't know. They didn't fill out my survey. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, they actually did. And they were not creative either. There's a sweet spot where you were quick to start but slow to finish, mm. where you, you took initiative to work on ideas early, but you resisted the temptation to foreclose. And instead, you delayed the completion and what that did was it helped you incubate. We did some follow-up experiments, and we found that if, if people procrastinated while they were working on an idea generation task, they did more divergent thinking. Um, they were less likely to get linear. stuck in these like, linear, structured ways to think. So this is a long way of saying, to answer your question, I decided that I was going to become more of a procrastinator while writing this book, because I wanted to have more creative ideas. So I procrastinated while writing the procrastination chapter. <laughs> did you only procrastinate in that bit? Uh, yes, mostly. Oh, right. I, I mean, some of the, the habits leaked over a little bit, but I, I literally, um, I woke up one morning and I made a procrastination to-do list. Um, it was like a set of steps on how to it. procrastinate. Um, and then I worked diligently toward my goal of not making progress toward my goal. So I woke up, I, 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 woke up I wrote a part of the procrastination chapter, and I literally stopped in mid-sentence and put it away for months, which was agony. I hated it. But then I came back with tons of new ideas. And I think, although you're not supposed to have a favorite child, I think it's the most original chapter in the book. Brilliant. Well, listen, that is a great thing to think to finish off. I love the idea of procrastination and kind of killing this short-term obsession that we tend to have um, with the world. So thank you so much, Adam. We have to wrap up at the moment. Um, Adam will be outside. The book is just on sale here in the foyer. Um, I think you're happy to answer some questions and to uh, sign some books. Um, but just really want to say a massive thank you to Adam for coming and sharing your story with us today and to the audience for being a great audience. Thank you.